thank you everyone in the audience for coming along and sharing your Tuesday, I think, with us. Tells you a lot about my state of mind that I'm not sure what day it is anymore. Um, we're here today to discuss this wonderful book, War and the City, uh, written um, over a number of years by Sara Fragonesi, who's here today to join us and talk about it and engage in a discussion about urban geopolitics, sectarianism, hybrid sovereignty, and wherever the conversation takes us. I know Hibba has got a few ideas of her own up her sleeve that she will throw into the mix. So I'm looking forward to seeing where this takes us. But I guess, first of all, I should, um, I should introduce our two wonderful guests. So first of all, we have Sara Fragonesi from the University of Birmingham, the author of War and the City, Urban Geopolitics in Lebanon, published by IB Taurus uh, and in set of Bloomsbury. And we both have our copies here. Excellent. Uh, and then, of course, joining us is the wonderful Hiba Bouakar, who is assistant professor in the urban planning program at Columbia. Um, Hiba is the the author of the equally wonderful for the war yet to come planning Beirut's frontiers. <laughs> Excellent. Exciting Tuesday morning about war here. Afternoon for you guys. <laughs> well, my copy of Hibba's book is, is buried in a box somewhere, but uh, I too have a, a wonderfully graffitied copy of it. And when it was suggested that Hibba could be a discussant for Sarah's book, I thought this would be wonderful. So I'm really looking forward to where this takes us today. There's a lot to cover, so I propose that we um, we just get on with the show, I guess, and see where the conversation takes us. If you would at any point like to ask a com uh, ask a question, do get in touch with the um, using the Q and A function at the bottom. Uh, we will have a, a short set of discussions and reflections amongst ourselves, and then we'll open the floor for questions towards the end. But Sara, I think first of all, what would be really useful. I think at least for me is to get a bit of context about the book, not so much the arguments, which we'll get onto in a minute, but why did you write the book? What, where did it come from? What was, what was the idea behind it? Okay. So first of all, thank you, Simon, uh, for inviting me at Sepphed to, to talk about this. I think it was about a year ago where we went all in Lancaster talking yeah. about uh, the role of urban space in, in, uh, in political uprising. Um, so here we are again. Um, so yeah, just a few words on, on, on how the book came together, really. Um, it's the combination of uh, three different um, research stages. So first, my, my PhD research, which was um, funded by a scholarship at Newcastle University between 2004 and 2008, and then um, my postdoctoral post research about sovereignty um, and the role of non-state armed uh, groups in the uh, 2008 clashes uh, in Beirut, which was part of a British Academy postdoctoral fellowship. Um, and that was between 2009 and 2012. And then more recently, I, um, uh, I developed the historical detail about the uh, territorial changes in Ottoman Mount Lebanon in the, 19, in the 1840s and uh, their impact on today's um, political sectarianism. Um, and the latter was funded by um, a pilot uh, grant by the um, British, um, the Council for British Research in the Levant in 2016. So um, uh, I, I feel like I have to thank the people at IB Tories as, as an imprint of Bloomsbury now that have been extremely patient uh, with the production of this book, which uh, all in all took seven years from, from contracting to, to publication due to several personal and academic reasons. So, but here we are. Um, so the, um, the, the, I think that the main, the main questions that underpin uh, what is in this book um, really go back to, um, to about 20 years ago when I, when I was still an, an undergraduate um, student. Um, going for my uh, first trips um, to Lebanon. Um, and, and those very same questions are still, I think, uh, what motivated me to, to, to write this. And um, so the first question is, um, 
it's a question of, of, of the geography of the civil war, the question of how relatively minuscule uh, spaces like roads and stretches of roads and neighborhoods, um, even single buildings, became not only strategically but also ideologically very important uh, for the actors in the conflict. Um, because I think we have been used to, for quite a long time in, in modern history, to to think about war as something that involves big territorial maneuvers, uh, often uh, along uh, state borders, you know, seeing big state armies um, going against each other. Um, and here instead, we have, um, at least in, the, in its first phases, we have a conflict where basically every, every street and um, every every bit of street and every building matters and has a story of its own and and uh, and has its own uh, meanings and matters in very complex uh, uh, ways. Um, and then, secondly, I think it's a question of representation, um, in that the the official representations of the Lebanese civil war in especially uh, Western popular. Um, uh, narratives like in the media but also in, in official international diplomacy they generally depicted the um, uh, Lebanon civil war as um, a a chaotic somehow um, quagmire um, and b as a as a proxy war uh, which are two narratives that we are sort of used to deal with when 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 it comes to talking about Lebanon, you know, the war for the others, or you know, the uh, the regional wars condensed into into a little country. Just look. and um, here instead in the book, I I chose to highlight something slightly different from this, which um, which which are the, the 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 rationalities that were actually at work um, among the various uh, non-state actors that were operating in urban space in very specific ways. Um, and somehow the official diplomacy and the statements of the international community at the time overlooked uh, this, uh, this variety uh, of views and this variety of agency, uh, of agencies in the city and over the cities. Um, and, uh, and why is it important? Because um, these agencies and, and, um, and uh, um, urban events, they contributed to, to, to the partition of the town, um, which lasted for a very long time. So somehow these representations overlooked um, something that was, was happening gradually, but that surely was going to impact its people for a long time. So if you want, the book is um, a sort of anti-geopolitical account um, of the Lebanese civil war. I, I wanted to take this unofficial non-state views of the war and put them center stage um, and see what spaces and what ways of, of mapping the conflict if you if you want um, then come into view um, so you have the you know the result is a sort of micro level and, and close up account if you want of certain uh, aspects of the civil war and and how these micro level dynamics were often quite blatantly dismissed in international foreign policy, um, so the, the the sort of book the book injects, if you want, the what are often the detached representations of foreign policy um, with you know with, with bodies with specific spaces and with specific agencies uh, that help us to to understand how the city was partitioned in those very first crucial phases of the of the conflict and the immense spatial change that would change people's lives for for decades to come um so this is uh what what i what i was trying to do and uh, so in the book the period i focus on is not the all of the conflict uh but the period between um april 1975 um and uh the uh, late october 1976 which is when the holiday in building gets uh, taken over by the militias of the national front and the partition line is completed by reaching the seafront. And this phase of the conflict goes under the name of two years war. And there are reasons for this choice. And maybe we can, you know, converse about them in, in, in what follows. Um, so this is what I was, uh, this is what I was thinking really when, when, I, when I did this. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think it's, it's really fascinating. I really enjoyed reading the book and your, your other pieces around it. 
um, which have shaped and I guess been shaped by the ideas in the book. Before we go to Hibbert, I wonder, can I just ask you a, a quick question that I asked my, uh, my PhD students? And that is, if we were to locate your book in a library, where would we file it? What sort of disciplinary section would we file it? Uh, not self-help, um, <laughs> probably. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a good question. I think um, I think it sort of would sit perhaps some, somewhere in between um, international relations, and uh, I mean there isn't really a human geography section in any in any in any library. I would say I would say, but uh, between international relations and urban studies, something like that. Um, I think um, I mean my background is in area studies. Uh, this is not a book on area studies. It's not, you know, a, a sort of a micro detailed uh, uh, historical account of the all of the conflict um, that that goes in sort of anthropological deep detail, if you want. But um, it tries to basically connect um, wider geopolitical narratives with with um, with more micro, if you want, urban dynamics. So, great. Thank you so much. Well. Let's turn to Hiba then, if that's okay. And what were your immediate reactions and reflections on reading the book, Hiba? Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I mean, thank you, Sarah, for this uh, wonderful book. And I feel like uh, what there are many, many accomplishments for the book, but the most striking one was how Sarah was able to bring a, a, a large section of conflicts that happened and affected Beirut and Lebanon and then how to think how, what was geographically happening at the time, uh, geopolitically, as in the region, but also on the local level. And I feel like if, if you are interested in understanding how the war shaped Beirut, this book provides you with a kind of, um, you, you need to start in this book because it provides you a clear under a clear uh, narrative of what was going on in different wars, like whether it was like the um, uh, the eighteen hundreds war between that uh, before the creation of the uh, of the state of Lebanon, uh, whether you're talking about the Ottoman, whether you're talking about the French uh, mandate, the civil war, and the first two sp two years specifically of the civil war, and then in the last before the last chapter, Sarah uh, talks also about the two thousand eight clashes, learning from what she did. Um, and in the previous on this two years war to try to understand that 2008 war. So for me, this is a foundational book for the, for anyone who's interested in trying to understand how war geographies shape the city, but also, and I think this is one of the main points of this book, how the city shaped the war, uh, which is what I think Sarah is project in this book is is that um, um, I think we're both uh, when you when you think about the geographical discussions about the war, like people who people cite usually to understand what is happening in the war. And they're all they all have been influential people in my work. Like so when we talk about Stephen, Stephen Graham, Derek Gregory, Martin Coward, etc. All these people, it's, it, it's a mostly like a bird's eye view understanding of war, which is very, very helpful. But it just doesn't bring you down. It do, you don't know what happened to the someone's um, someone's bedroom or house or wall or street or neighborhood in this kind of conflict. What you see is more like how these um, uh, nations that are fighting, usually it's nations or axes, uh, are like seeing the war. So you're seeing it top down. And I think what Sarah is trying to do is bring a historic narrative. I tried to do that in my book from an anthropological, more detailed perspective of the current moment. What I think Sarah does really well is actually provide a historical narrative, the urban history that tried to help us to understand what was happening. And speaking back to the geopolitical narrative, and I think in some ways, um, debunking these binaries, like it's this kind of war or that kind of war, or this was the winner or that one winner. And I think one of the fascinating word, uh, phrases that I, um, uh, that Sarah uses in the book is, is uh, she uses, I think, that the tectonics of geopolitics. And I was like, this was really um, thought provoking for me because it means that on the geo what, what you see, there is there are shifting um, layers of underneath the geopolitics that are not usually talked about in the geopolitics. And so she tries to map them through oral interviews for the two year war and through archival research for the wars be uh, before in the 50s and the 1800s. Yeah, I really enjoyed that too, that sort of movement between different levels of analysis, but also the complexities of the of both of the city and everything that's going on in the city, but how that spills out into conflict, how conflict spills out onto the streets of the city, mm -hmm. shifting between the, the, the macro and the micro, but 
with an emphasis on the impact of the micro. I think that's so important. And often, as, as you flag up in, in the book and elsewhere, Sarah, the, that sort of story about the micro and, and agency and how all of this affects people and the spaces in which people inhabit is missed. So I think that's so really, so very important in, in what you're doing. Yeah, and, and I think what is also important is, is to think about spatially and architecturally and in terms of urbanism, because um, if you hang out in Lebanon, I mean, I was born and raised there, but if, if, you have, if, you lang uh, if you hang out long enough in Lebanon, you start hearing about like, oh, these brothers were in two different militias during the war. And then they kind of like the conflict was part of their household um, at some point, or they, they fought on different sides, et cetera, et cetera. But then what I think is very interesting becomes like how, what buildings each militia was able to take, what kind of spaces where they could move is, is not dictated by whoever was fighting at the time geopolitically, but mostly about what you were able to do in the trenches at the time. And what ended happening, how, it, how the cities has been partitioned, uh, then became part of the geopolitical narrative. And so I feel like the ground up framework that Sarah provides is also very important for understanding the urbanism of war and the urbanism of political violence. And its yeah. architectures also. Definitely. So. Picking up on that then, Sarah, tell us a little bit about the, the rhythms, uh, the urban rhythms or the spatial rhythms of, of conflict in the book then, please. How is it that, that this plays out across Beirut and what are the implications of that for, for the, the sort of the macro level that Hibber's just flagged up? Yeah, thanks for the, the two uh, uh, very uh, thought-provoking and, and uh, really sort of uh, uh, striking observations uh, from both you and Eva. Um, um, so I, I think what this conversation makes me think about is sort of three spatialities that we can use to think about the, the conflict and its complexities. Um, and, and there is all, always this uh, uh, non-separation between, between the urban and, and the geopolitical, so to say. So the, the first is the returns and the overlappings of, of histories and, and, and spaces. And as Eva was saying, you know, these these spatial dynamics of conflict that return, that, that for me, you know, are, are, are set around 1840 or 1816, Ottoman in the Ottoman Levant, and then keep returning because sectarianism as a sort of um, um, governmentality is not only about shaping social subjects and political subjects. It's not only about changing the way you identify yourself politically, you know, with a religion rather than, you know, with a certain family or with a certain lineage. It's about how you see space and where and where you can go and what you consider your space and, and instead someone else's um, uh, space. So it's about the territorialization that becomes different from what it was before. And, and for me, that, um, that returns during the war because what you know again is represented as quagmire as as you know the the collapse of the state or 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 you know however it has been defined as as chaos or primordial you know tendencies to to you know uh to 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 kill the per the people of the other group actually if you look um there are there there are spatial processes that return you know there's uh, there's a tracing of dividing lines, there's the demarcation of territory, there's the um, purging of villages, there, there's, the, the, there's the reprisals, uh, there's, you know, the, the attempt to gain high points in the city in order to control better the territory. So, you know, spatial taxonomies that do speak to modern European uh, territorialities that keep returning uh, during the civil war within uh, the you know the the way of operating that uh, that the militias had and and you know with with this way of operating they literally reshaped uh, the space of the city. Okay, so in in that way we can see you know we can see the at least the, the first phases of the civil war as a post colonial. Uh, as a post-colonial conflict, and perhaps it's really from there, from those spatialities and materialities, uh, as as you know, it's, it's a point that Hiba also does that we need to start really to decolonize sectarianism. Um, and the second, I think, uh, kind of uh, of of spatial metaphor that that we could use is the micro and and micro, as as Simon pointed out. And um, what I try and show in the book is that really. Uh, the, the the regional geopolitics and the local militias did not um, 
they they did not sustain themselves independently from each other. Uh, there was always some sort of um, uh, connecting line. So the the militias would actually um, draw their their narratives about how to to envision the city and re envision it and and to reshape it according to ideological and territorial projects that that were were actually uh, underpinned by wider uh, and and if you want you know. Uh, um, um, uh, professed affiliation also to, to wider regional uh, narratives like, you know, Pan-Arabism, for example. Um, and, and one of the questions at, at the basis of the conflict was the Lebanese question, you know, do we see the role of Lebanon in the world and in the Middle East as a nation, as, you know, a bounded nation state that follows the uh, boundaries that France uh, uh, decided it should have in 1920, or do we actually see Lebanon as a more, um, a less territorially bounded entity which is affiliated to a wider Arab interland? And that, you know, quite was the question at the basis of uh, depicting and wanting to reimagine the city in certain ways or, or others by the militias. And so there is this, you know, they, they are not completely irrational thugs like they were, uh, you know, uh, described in many of, of, of the statements in international foreign policies. Uh, thugs have also got rationalities and they operate according to very systematic uh, um, mechanisms. Um, so, um, the, the, there is a connection, and and the, and the other very important point is the banking binaries, and I think that here, especially he and I have have, have uh, very much in common in her book for the warrior to come. Instead, so the other way, it really made me see how through urbanism and through and through how the urban morphology and and the urban fabric is uh, envisioned by planners and and is. Uh, rationalized and organized, you can actually understand what's going on geopolitically at a wider level. So for me, you know, this this debunking of binaries between geopolitics and urbanism, or this war or that war or this phase of the war, and even between conflict and post-conflict, um, is is uh, something that that we always need to bear in mind. So in the in the book, I talk about subjugate, subjugating knowledges in in the Foucauldian kind of way, which is you know what he defines as the, the non commonsensical knowledges that people have, and so this point that the non state actors, the militias fighting in the city, reorganizing this you know this space for decades to come, uh, to think of these as uh, non knowledges or non rationalities is for me. Uh, completely uh, uh, nonsensical. So they are non-commonsensical knowledges that do not make it into the, 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 the hegemonic or dominant narratives of international foreign politics. However, they do have uh, a massive impact on, on, on the micro level, as we saw. But do you want to add to that then, given the, the reference to your book and some of the things that you, you pick out of that? Um, yeah, I mean, I... Um... One of the one of the interesting things that that I feel like um, was interesting for me to to see. Uh, I mean, it's not like I, we didn't know it, but I just to see it like how it breaks back is that through the uh, the oral histories that or the interview the long interviews that uh, that Sarah did with with the former uh, former civil war militias, and it's very interesting to me because it, when I was doing interviews for uh, like for some for not even for for. Uh, for times of peace, that is like what thirty years later, actually the same logics, the same spiritual logics of which hills do you go, which which uh, where how do you, uh, uh, the rumors that were circulating about where where what is how is this building going to be a sniper location and stuff? Uh, it's very interesting because you see it in Sarah how like these things were operational in the first part of war and how they continue, and then they kind of don't go away, and so. At the time I was interviewing, there was quote unquote no war, but you see that the logics that were operationalizing uh, or the rationalities that Sarah is talking about uh, do stay there. And so even when people are thinking about a future war that may or might not come, uh, they are also thinking about how they it, the past war played. It's a it's not a it's the same kind of technologies that they're thinking about. Of course, maybe the rifles are more advanced, etc. But the same geographic thinking because this is how they fought war. This is how they fought the previous wars, and somehow there's these kind of knowledges are what is used to shape um, to shape 
like so these histories shape how they expected expected their roles in the future wars and i i, I think that was striking because you read you read the same things in the interviews that Sarah did about like how they wanted to take the highest building or go over this hill, etc. And how even when I interviewed people in 2009, 2010, they were talking about the same kind of logic in a new context. This is not the city center. These are the peripheries, uh, etc. So this was this was very interesting for me to see. Uh, but I also I feel like um, one um, one question or one um, maybe conversation we can have is, is uh, Sarah has been very engaged and contributed to the discourses on herbicide and uh, the herbicide specifically in, in the context of uh, Lebanon where people are talk we talk about sectarianism. And so maybe Sarah can talk a little bit about, uh, first about your understanding of herbicide and how you how your research in Beirut pushed that idea. Uh, and then second, how does that intersect with the idea of sectarianism? And maybe th third, I'm interested in then what do we learn? How do you theorize from that to think about um, maybe cities beyond beyond Beirut. Mm. We warned you, Sara. We warned you the questions were going to be tough. <laughs> A nice grilling before Christmas. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> At least Can I, I got two, two weeks to recover from this. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just no, add, I have no. a, um, a paper come back with some comments um, with a reference to herbicide. And the comment was from a political scientist actually in this room who flagged up a lack of awareness of herbicide. So Sarah delves into the list of attendees. Um, but I think that's that's really interesting with regard to what you were saying at the start about your disciplinary location, because it's a concept that is perhaps found more within a particular set of discussions. So I wonder if you could perhaps just for those people coming at at this conversation from maybe a more traditional IR um, poli sci background, just give us a, a quick overview of what herbicide is, please, Sara. Before going on to the much more eloquent and sophisticated question that Hibber put forward. Right. Okay. So uh, actually, herbicide doesn't start. That the, the idea is not born in a context of war. It's actually born in a context of um, a quite aggressive urban regeneration, so to say. Right. With um, Ada Louise Axtable was an architectural critique in the US who was talking about the demolition of the Ashmoleb Ash mills uh, in, uh, in uh, New Hampshire uh, to make place for um, um, new buildings and, you know, post-industrial landscapes. And she called it herbicide and she said, you know, can we please do something different or, you know, do we have to get rid of these multifunctional spaces in, in order, you know, to, to and, and this, you know, industrial heritage to bring in uh, something, something new. So she was speaking in the, uh, I believe, late 50s. And then, you know, uh, Marshall Berman, uh, with a rather Marxist uh, perspective, he he actually uh, continued talking about or beside in the context of the renovation of the Bronx and the uh, and the you know demolition and managed the managed uh, decline if you want of some of the uh, residential properties there to make space for uh, the new sort of motorway system and he actually is a he made a very interesting comparison because he, he said that the landscape of rubble in the Bronx uh, resembles that of Beirut during the war. He was speaking in 1984. So he is basically the first who makes this explicit uh, comparison between the rubble of urban regeneration and the rubble of urban conflict. And then, you know, you don't really hear about herbicide anymore for a little while. Um, until the word comes out again in 1992 in the context of uh, the destruction of the, uh, the old bridge in Mostar. Uh, it was a collective of architects, interestingly enough, who uh, talked again about herbicide in this time in a full context of war. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the mayor of uh, Belgrade, former uh, Bogdan Bogdanovic, again, uh, you know, a, a, a architect talked about you know herbicide as a sort of erasure of the uh, of the he talked about the sense of urbanity and you know we can be a little bit critical of that but then you know the way i address herbicide essentially it's it's it there's a time and a place i did my phd in newcastle and basically when i started my phd uh, martin coward who wrote the book uh, the politics of herbicide had just finished his phd dissertation uh, there and you know moved on to academic jobs and uh, i i picked up his dissertation in the library and was and was struck um by this idea of herbicide i mean he he's a political scientist so he didn't you know he didn't do the field work 
bit of, of work that, that, you know, that, that as a geographer, you, you, you would do. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, his, his analysis was, you know, going back to Heidegger, uh, philosophically, it was very, uh, very striking. And basically, um, he, he defined the politics of herbicide as uh, killing the city, but in the sense of taking away the, the material possibility for people of different kinds to come together uh, in the same space. And this space does not only include very, you know, very symbolic spaces like, you know, religious buildings or, you know, um, uh, monuments or emblematic squares. It, it includes really uh, everyday buildings. Uh, he mentioned, you know, even post offices or anything that symbol that, that, that say embodies uh, the coming together of people in a functioning uh, uh, society that includes diversity within itself. At the moment you take away these uh, these spaces, you take away this, the possibility for different groups to come together. And obviously it makes a lot of sense in the context of the Balkan conflict, but, uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense in the in the context of the of, of Lebanon's conflict as well, because the, the, the way I take forward the conversation about Herbicide is actually um, you don't need to have complete destruction and obliteration uh, as it often happened in the Balkans where you know you destroy the mosque and then not only you destroy the mosque but you build a car park on top which is you know a complete non-space where it doesn't really belong to anyone so you take you completely obliterate everything that can possibly go on there but instead what i found in lebanon is that there is a very wide gray area of what can constitute um herbicide, it, it might not only be complete destruction, it might, it might be, you know, a, a, the transfer of a portion of population from a place to another, the reorganization of a neighborhood, you know, the renaming of, of streets, the, the, you know, the, the gradual uh, uh, taking away uh, of state services and putting them in the hands of, you know, uh, religious or political organizations. There is, there are a lot of ways of reorganizing the way people relate to things in a city in a way that changes the political project that underpins uh, that, you know, that those social relations. Um, so this is the way I, I, I conceive uh, herbicide. And I think, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to talk in terms of herbicide regarding, you know, to Syria, where it is very clear that planning there is, is you know, responsible for certain ways of organizing cities politically nowadays um and and yeah so this is this is a little bit where where i'm coming from with herbicide in the book thanks so much so with regard to hibba's points then um and the relationship between herbicide and and say and sectarianism, sectarianism. Yeah. Yeah. how does that um, play out uh so again I, it's it's uh um it's very, it was quite straightforward for me to make the link from what Martin Coward was talking about in the Balkans war, because it was a very heavy religious um, and political component there in that conflict. Um, and here for me, um, uh, herbicide is the, the, the reorganization of Beirut in, in, sectarian, in sectarian terms. So, you know, the partition, uh, the, you know, a lot of people this, the, defined the partition of Beirut as, you know, creating almost an anti-city, you know, taking away the possibility for different kinds of sects, different kinds of people from, you know, different be sectarian belonging to come together in space. Um, but also uh, actually making, um, making meaningful the sectarian belonging in ways that perhaps wasn't so much in the 1970s or, or was in a different way. Um, and so it goes back to that return of these uh, technologies and ways to operationalize and weaponize identity that Hiba was talking about. You know, the, the, the arms might be more technologically advanced, but the, way, the ways we have to partition, you know, to divide people from each other, to take away the, 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 the fabric, the urban fabric where they come together is, is, is paramount. There is a, an image in the book, uh, which is um, for me very important. It's, a, it's a, from the town of Rasheya um, in, uh, in Eastern Lebanon. And it was taken during an expedition of the then Prince of Wales, which would go on to become Edward VII. There it is. Thank you, Eva. I was also flicking through the pages desperately. Um, 
So this is Rasheya, which was the object of uh, widespread ravaging in the 1860s when a series of sectarian uh, conflicts, uh, yeah, wars spread basically through uh, the Beka Valley and uh, in Mount Lebanon and reached even Damascus. And so uh, what, the, what the Prince of Wales noted, he was on an expedition, he had his photographer, uh, Francis Bat Batford, and, you know, they took a lot of pictures of, of, of Rashaya and Hasbeya, which were two particularly uh, mm, uh, heat uh, villages. And he said, you know, we saw the houses that were burnt down and, you know, he tells, you know, this, this amount of people from this uh, sect were killed and this amount of people from this sect were killed. And for me, it's very significant because we tend to think about herbicide as killing the city, as in it's something that kills urbanity as a way of life. You know, life in a city is different from life in a village, for example. And, you know, there's something about urban life that needs to be defined and is different from rural life. And, you know, it, that is what is targeted. Actually, for me, these are very, again, we go back to the binaries. Uh, they are Weberian modern bi binaries that we need to debunk. You know, this division between the urban and the rural, uh, perhaps it's, it's uh, you know, it's the case of the banking and because actually here we are in quite rural location, but we can see the wanton destruction, you know, of, of, of houses, but also of um, outer buildings like, you know, for, for, uh, for farming purposes, uh, destruction of walls, um, the pillaging of crops and fields. So there is a wanton destruction um, of something that was in a rural context, but nonetheless gave the opportunities, the opportunity to certain communities to come together and identify themselves politically in certain ways um, and, you know, to take away all of that in order to replace, replace it with something new, okay, and leave, and leave you know, a, a certain level of ravaging behind. And for me, this is, you know, this speaks a lot to, uh, to the way uh, herbicide and sectarianism are interlinked. Um, so herbicide is reorganizing, you know, the, the political subjectivity and the political religious subjectivity by way of reorganizing the space that underpins it. So. It's interesting to hear you sort of talking about herbicide as a means of reinforcing particular identities, which is, is perhaps a slightly different way than that others have, have looked at it, which I found fascinating. But I wonder here, but to what extent do you think that process continues over time, given that you've, you've worked more recently on these types of themes, your book focuses um, on the, the, the more recent past than the, the more historical past that Sara looks at. To what extent do you sh do you observe similar types of patterns manifesting? Um, I mean, of course, um, um, the concept of of the destruction of space. Um, think like thinking of the destruction of space as integral, as not just a byproduct of war, uh, which is the Iber side is trying to say, is that it is. Uh, a tool of war, like destroying a space, whether it is it is an urban space or a rural space. When you are destroying space, it's just not that you like. It's just not a byproduct. It is actually a target itself, and it's constitutive on what kind of geography you want to emerge as a result of that war. Like so, the architectures of enmity are not only you construct certain people as as your opponents, but then you actually. Uh, and this is us geographers or people who think from the urban perspective that when you've constructed a, a, a someone as an enemy or as an other, they have a certain geography that associate with them. And then when you are waging a war against them or a violence against them, there is a geography that is targeted as part of that. And I think this is what herbicides make clear, brings to the attention that it's not you're just having a war and the, oh, you hit the building by mistake. It's that the hitting of the building is constitutive and a tool of war as well. And uh, what I look at, because I'm not looking specifically at, at, at war, what I look at is actually how it's not only destruction maybe, but then when you think about construction itself as a tour of war. This is, of course, is biggest when you talk about the, the construction of the Israeli settlements in the state of Israel and the it was secession of the, the Palestinian uh, populations. But you also see it in a much more different way, and we can talk now I think this is a segue to talk about how religious political organizations then and what Sarah called hybrid sovereignty is come to think because because what's main difference what is main the, the difference between like the kind of offensive that is done by the state of Israel in constructing settlements versus the kind of construction that I uh, uh, trace in my book is 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 the kind of different actors that operate so while in the in the in the state of and I I think Sarah takes talks a little bit how most of the discourses on urban, on urban violence are kind of 
in the state of Israel or in Bosnian war. Uh, but when you talk about the case of Lebanon, it brings to perspective a different kind of thinking about it. Because uh, in the state of Israel, for example, there is a dominant state and dominant ethno-national state that kind of is in control of all planning, all construction, all uh, infrastructure, everything that is constitutive of the urban environment. But when you think about that, and that's why it complicates herbicide in Lebanon, and that's why I asked about sectarianism, is um, there, isn't a, there isn't a dominant actor. It's not like it's clear, there's not like a clear way Winner or a career person who is dominant, uh, dominating the government. I mean, what I um, and this is where Sarah and I have um, not different takes, but like um, interesting um, um, takes about these actors. So what I what I think how I think about actors like the Sunni Future Movement, the uh, Shia Hezbollah, or the Morabitun, which is they were biggest in the first the two year war that Sarah mm -hmm. traces. These are the government, and they are outside the government. And Sarah through this. Um, in her um, interviews, it shows exactly how uh, these uh, these militiamen were also the state were giving them resources because of the connections they had. And eventually, 20, 30 years later, when I'm interviewing them in my book, they are actually part of the state, and th they are the state. So now they sit on the table. We don't have a government actually because they can't agree. But they also oper operate uh, outside the state. And because of that, then it's very difficult to understand who's dominating who, or you can't have a very sim a binary or um, not well, binary, like a clear view of, of, of then the architecture, the building, the constructions of, of war, the um, a construction as a tool of, uh, to war. So then you have to really, um, uh, really think from the ground up to try to understand what's going on, which is very different than under the, for example, the, the construction as a tool of war uh, under the state of Israel, for example. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel this is, um, so I don't know if you still call it herbicide. I think herbicide is by the nef definition uh, a, 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 like a destruction from the, mm -hmm. uh, but, but what, we, what I look at is more the construction uh, and how certain uh, spaces that were destroyed during the war, like for example in Haimad in Marm Khair, which would figure out in the two-year war that Sarah is talking about, end up being reinscribed in these new geographies of conflict as, as contested territories over contested um, uh, buildings and land in these new forms of conflict. Sarah, do you want to come back to that? Other than, uh, otherwise, I've got a wonderful segue that Hiba has just neatly set up. But I want to give you a chance to come back on anything that Hiba has just said, if you want. Um, I find it very interesting. Just one one point. Um, this uh, the, the the teasing out the differences uh, politically that then impact on the way space is reorganized or or you know destroyed, constructed that there isn't a dominant actor in Lebanon, obviously that, that's clear, but also we, there seems to be, um, the, I think the issue is being inside or outside a state or being both at the same time. And the way my thinking is evolving with this and, and especially, you know, with the 2008 chapter is that uh, Certain groups are part of the state, very clearly, but they're also ready to go against the state very quickly whenever the state impinges on their way of organizing space in a way that they think protects the state. For example, you know, with the, with this, with the outlawing of uh, Hezbollah's telecommunications and Hezbollah, you know, declaring that basically a, a coup and a, a declaration of war by the state. Uh, so Hezbollah was arguing at the same time that the telecommunications were uh, to protect the state, to protect the integrity of the state from, you know, um, other countries' surveillance, but at the same time, they went against the state when the state tried to outlaw them. So for me, the metaphor of the war machine perhaps worked better, better in this case, because, you know, you have entities that are at the same time inside the state uh, and they work inside the state and they function perfectly inside the state. They're part of it, they participate in the debate, but they also have got the tools to be against it and to work against it also through political violence. So. Perhaps we need to think in terms of, of war, war machines, but at the same time, you know, and perhaps it's something that I want to, to then put to Hiva and bring the conversation perhaps to a more, let's say, I don't want to say hopeful because I, 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 I know that, you know, but, but from reading Hiva's uh, latest writings, you know, there, there are certain uh, 
uh, colonial views of hope that I don't want to reinforce, but like a more uh, future looking uh, perspective. Can we talk about peace machines? Like, does durable peace need to, to come from the state? Or can it come from, you know, from the bottom up, as, as Hiba was pointing out, you know, there is nothing that says that durable peace in Lebanon cannot come from grassroots initiatives, especially, you know, after the October Revolution. So if we don't have a dominant actor uh, in, you know, in political violence, do we need a dominant actor in order to create durable peace? Do we actually need the state? This is a question for me. Uh, oh, it's, I, well, it's for everyone. Really, but it's inspired, I suppose. I wish I, I wish I had the solution. No, I mean, I, I, I think what, what, one of the one ways we can think about it is what happened after the August 4th explosion in Beirut that ripped Beirut. I mean, uh, I, I think last I, I was there last October. I, I spent like several months in Lebanon and I was fortunate to experience a moment that I didn't think I will experience in my lifetime. I know it died soon after, kind of, but the October Revolution, and then a few months afterwards, we had we had like a um, economic the economic um, worst crisis ever, and then the explosion. But what's happening after the August Fourth explosion is that discussion in Lebanon is going around how okay, it's clear you cannot depend on something called the state. There is no state. And so you cannot ask it to, to reconstruct. You cannot uh, ask the state to do anything. They, they basically cause, the, cause the, the explosion with their neglect, you know, like they are. So I think the conversation is right now moving. So without, with, without having a state, what do you do? Who are the people? How do you go about reconstruction? How do you be, go about restitching the urban fabric? How do you go about reconstituting your neighborhoods or changing the way they're going to be uh, rebuilt, etc. And I feel this is a conversation in which I think um, people gave up on the idea of a state. Uh, and I have two things to say on, uh, on this. I personally did not use the word state in my book. And I explained mm -hmm. why. Um, I, I said that in my thinking, it was very hard for me to say the word state. Um, I felt like, at least in the work I was doing, it, 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 it it hides more than it it explains in some ways. Like when I say the state, whose state? W w but the state is there because anything you're gonna do in terms of urban planning, any kind of master plans, etc., they have to have these signatures. So there is a performance of state, and there is a state. But at the same time, there are you can. I felt like if I use the word state, I I have to clarify who's exactly doing what. And therefore, I took the decision in my book not to use the word state, but I explained that you cannot, these things operate through state institutions, but I opted to think about these actors that are the state and outside the state. But then I, I was like even more, um, but then this is one view about thinking about, about the state. But then you have the other kind of uh, view, which is like for me, like not use the word state, but acknowledge that it exists in the way it were. But then for example, like the what's happening in, in Lebanon, um, what happened, you, you talk a little bit about Beirut Madinati, but even the people who are still uh, working from based on Beirut Madinati and afterwards, like uh, Nafawaz, etc., they, they still feel like we need to believe in the project of the state. We still need to keep the project of the state alive because this is how you do uh, redistribution of resources. This is how you do, uh, how, this is how you at least try to maintain public interest, public spaces, etc., etc. So I feel like there is a big debate going on in Lebanon uh, about what, how to think about the state and what to do with it. And I think there are very important political repercussions to how we end up theorizing the state based on what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so like you, I feel like the discourses that say failed state and weak state and state within a state are actually not that helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd rather talk about hybrid so sovereignties like you're talking or the, the state, I don't have a one word for it, but these actors that constitute the state outside or other people who are talking about how how sometimes you see the state in certain places like i think the state was very prevalent in the reconstruction of downtown beirut by privatizing it but it was there to privatize it like uh, rafiel hariri in the 90s and then you see it completely absent in the one dahi for example where the state is not talked about uh, so you so sometimes you see the state is put forward and sometimes you see it absent and i feel like this is much more helpful than to like just use the word the state or no state or failed state mm -hmm. or weak state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is my thing about state. In terms of, of 
peace then i mean i because i don't think that war and peace are two distinct things and i feel like when in a place that has um that had a geog had a history of war even something like europe post war like i i wonder and maybe you can tell tell me more because i i haven't lived in europe does this ever go away or for example like the Naz Na discusses about Na nazi and what they did spatially to the jewish people keeps coming back for example does it ever go away does the geographies of war disappear so that we can actually think about peace or are they reconfigured um institutionalized in zoning and master planning in order to stop the war from happening again Can I, Can I throw something in there as well, Sarah? Um, uh, yes. Uh, on the idea of state, I also wonder, though, however, because in the book, the chapter on sectarianism and the way it came about, the state, I mean, the state is over there as a reference in the background, though, because the, 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 the taxonomy, the reason of being of political sectarianism is the project of creating a modern nation state in Lebanon because in the view of the European powers, the Ottoman Empire didn't quite make it. Um, so the, the, the state is, is there in the shadow. It's always, that's why I'm saying, you know, do we actually need it? Because once you take a step back and, and say, right, okay, but the state set the narrative of it, uh, but it only set it from a certain period in time. And um, perhaps it doesn't need to be the sole narrator of, of things. Yeah, but then the know? question comes back from like, for example, from urban planning that says, mm -hmm. okay, so if, if you're gonna like put all your eggs in the basket of, of grassroots, who, who is gonna be ensure that there is like equal redistribution of resources if, if it's yeah. ever happened? Or who's gonna ensure that there is the public interest however you want to define it, uh, if, it's, if it's not an omnipresent something like, like a state. And who says that this NGOization that is going on and the grassroots movements uh, have everyone's interest, um, uh, everyone's, also again, these are all like terms to be clarified, but like in, just in terms of a general discourse, uh, who says that they have everyone's interest um, in, in their heart? What if they only want to like rebuild, not, not even sect, like what if you're gonna, they only want to uh, think about the richer people, the people who can still own, or the people who can buy the properties that were destroyed, and then just uh, cater for that. Let's say, uh, just for the sake of being devil's advocate. So, um, so yeah. So, so if you think about it from other kind of perspectives, then you like wonder if it's not the state, which is fine. I'm not saying either way. Uh, then how we can go about it? And I think there's a question in the maybe Basil. Yeah. I also found extremely interesting your, your question about, you know, do the geographies of war ever go away? I mean, we are literally in the UK, uh, what are we, 15, uh, 16 days away from something big happening, potentially without a deal, uh, which is essentially a continuation of um, a big debate about a massive post-war reconstruction project, which is the European Union, essentially. It, it's born as, you know, as an agreement on how do we reconstruct Europe in a way that war does not return. So how do we ensure that we reconstruct so that violence doesn't come back? And so we are still talking about that. And we are still, you know, trying to, to, to strike different kinds of deals in, in, in you know, in ways that, um, you know, uh, the, yeah, we still have got political debates about that, so it doesn't go away. And I mean, um, yeah, yeah, I, I find it really fascinating. Yeah, and since they don't go away, then what does peace mean, and what yeah. does war mean? Of course, you know. And um, I feel like I feel like, for example, from the US, because now I'm speaking from New York, and we just had like re the, the past six months the resurgence again of the Black Lives Matter movements, and like going. Uh, myself even part of these movements on the streets and even like you know slavery like slavery that didn't go away in in many ways so um so then what does it help us to talk about about i mean and, and this is a question open question i'm not expecting anyone to what does it help us to think about uh, whether it's peace or war and i'm sure there is room for that but i'm just like maybe we can push our discussion on then what what does it what does it what are we looking for i mean that piece you read about hope um, i as i said like people always and it was inspired by um, the reviews, one of one of uh, one of which is yours about my book. Is that where's where do we locate hope in the geographies 
of Beirut and like the sectarian geographies of Beirut, maybe, or in a place in which there's always a war or an explosion or something to, to uh, that's, uh, that's in the future. Um, and I, I mean, I always struggled with answering that question. I mean, like, what, what is, what is hope? And I had to really seriously think about it because after you mar after marching in the October, um, um, October 2019 uh, uh, uprising in Lebanon, and after marching in the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests here, it is, it is. They, they are hopeful moments. But then we have to think about the materiality of peace and war, or the question is whether they go away. And then how do you dismantle them if you want to dismantle them? And I feel like sometimes when I listen to what's going on here about racism and Jim Crow and slavery and how like they never went away, they were just used in zoning and real estate, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, things in Europe about Nazism and the, uh, and other things, other conflicts, um, like the colonial, the col French colonialism of North Africa, for example, and how now the suburbs of uh, Paris. Yeah, I wonder what it, what does it help to 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 talk about. Um, the distinction between peace mm -hmm. and but I'm open for suggestions, and I think there's a question in the yeah in the in the chat. Yeah, we'll we'll get onto that in a second. Because I just wanted to pick up one of the the ways you navigate some of those tensions, Sarah, between the state and the various actors that are laying claim to to power is this idea of hybrid sovereignties, mm -hmm. which is is a really interesting idea as a means of of moving beyond that that old sort of. Eurocentric, Western, philosophically dominated, uh, barbarian model of sovereign power, which obviously dates back to the 17th century, and yet many apply it to, to mm -hmm. the contemporary world in completely different contexts. And you try and, and address that through this idea of, of hybrid sovereignties. But I, I wonder, where does that concept leave us now in light of everything that happened with the October revolutions in light of uh, COVID-19, the ongoing struggle for, um, I guess, a, a, a token part of those sovereignties or a token part of, of this thing that we may or may not call a state. I, mm -hmm. It's a bit speculative and goes beyond the book, of course, but I just wonder mm -hmm. if you can take that concept and, and help us to, to view what's going on in Lebanon using that, please. Yes, um, I, I, I'll also try and connect a little bit to this uh, idea of hope, which I, I think it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, um, so in the conclusions of the book, and yes, it's a bit speculative, but in the conclusions of the book, I, I start talking a little bit about, you know, where, where can we go from here to, you know, to, to try and create some, some spaces for, for peace, you know, that's a non durable peace. And, um, and what I start talking about is um, this presence of, um, of elements. And, uh, you know, we've ascertained that the state is a very malleable concept. Um, we cannot really trace an inside and outside the state. And uh, um, there is a lot of cross-pollination between state actors and non-state actors and the urban space and its control, both during the conflict uh, and also during other instances of political violence, uh, like in 2008, as well as in times of peace. You know, we see how urban space, and you know, Hiba also, you know, explains that so well in her book. We see that the urban space is basically a, an ingredient of, of, of that um, hybridization of sovereignty, that, you know, the, the state is not by no means the only controller of, of, urban, of urban infrastructure and space. Um, so we've ascertained that, and and for me, perhaps a way of understanding um, how urban politics works, or the way the way to perhaps to, um, to to start changing the way we see urban politics uh, in Beirut, but also elsewhere, is to basically focus on the elements that make the city be what it is. So you know, and and, and the elements the physical elements, you know, the physical agencies that uh, mobilize and make possible certain kinds of politics. So, you know, if you think of electricity, I mean, there is a, you could narrate the history of politics in Beirut only thinking about, you know, the, the, the physic, 
the physics of electricity. Uh, you know, think about water uh, and, you know, uh, wastewater or irrigation water or flood water and what it is doing to the country and, and you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the policies of fire, which for me, you know, uh, we, we have seen uh, um, a revolution in October, which was mainly urban in, in, in several cities beyond Beirut, but really uh, what set the tone for it was the way people mobilized because of the fires that took place in the Shuv Mountains. And, you know, this is the moment where you saw a different dividing line. So on the one hand, you had this inefficient, idle state, and which, you know, had some helicopters that could have stopped the fire, but they were, you know, in disrepair because of negligence and, and so and on the other side you had um the civil society you had people being organized and mobilizing themselves in order to help each other and yes the you know the day after the the the, the fires you had this you know new tax that the government announced and that somehow was more than the cause it was like the last the last straw you know you try and kill us by fire, by not repairing the helicopters that could have tamed the fire. So you expose us to fire and then you tax us. And, and you know, this, this was the, the concoction that basically got, uh, you know, the, 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 the bodies on the, on the street that, that night and, and, you know, and, and we know what, what followed. And so, um, this is this is what I mean. So if you focus on the way uh, the agency of physical elements, uh, natural elements, you know, you look at the ecologies and how they acquire political agency because of, uh, you know, certain negligences or certain, you know, misuses, misappropriations of resources, and you follow that, then you, you bring up, uh, you bring up different mappings you know, of, of, of how this, the, 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 the country is or is not working nowadays. There's an interesting project that I talk about at the end of the book, which is called uh, Act for the Disappeared. And basically it uses geology and, um, um, you know, remote sensing technologies that essentially map uh, the underground in order to find uh, the location of mass graves and uh, burial sites uh, during the Civil War. Uh, which then uses the data to help the families that are essentially missing for their loved ones that are, you know, still considered, um, they're searching for the lo loved ones which are still considered missing. Um, and there is a point about that project which strikes me, which is, we, they, cannot, they cannot actually use the data now because the, the state is not interested in tracing responsibilities for who did what during the Civil War. Um, but it's data about what the soil contains, you know, in terms of traces, in ter terms of forensics, in terms of DNA that is there, that can be used in case, you know, literally for the peace yet to come, in case there is a future government who is open to investigating the responsibilities of the civil war. And for me, this is very interesting because here the action is purely about gathering forensic data that can provide evidence that can be used in politics, in, you know, to, to set up a different politics. And for me, this is very important. And, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I one of the things that I am, um, <laughs> as a citizen, not as an urbanist, uh, I'm not for like, absolving the state of anything and personally i would still is actually to hold people accountable because i feel like the negligence that stealing that happened the stealing the 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 they basically robbed people of every robbed the people the people who live in lebanon of everything they like of the taxes of the resources of the air of the pollution like polluting everything stealing everything not leaving anything and now which which, which is what we're seeing right now and then um um uh, and then then they pretend that they are fighting, but at the same time, they're sitting together, uh, pretending to be the government at the same time, governing basically uh, their own um, benefits from, from the government. So for one thing, as a citizen of, of, of Lebanon, I don't want the state to kind of not, I, I keep wanting to trace the state because I want to whoever at some point be held accountable 
not even for the civil war, like not that back ago, but just for the past after the civil war, how these resources were stolen, how the environment was destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one thing, this is one thing about the state that I still think it's not only about the public interest and the squares and stuff, which is coming from the urbanists, but also about accountability and about maybe one day uh, people can be held accountable for what, what they did, irrespective of which group, uh, all of them, I guess, uh, together. But one, one other interesting thing that was striking to me is that when I started engaging with people who uh, lived, uh, who work on other wars. Um, and I realized that in Lebanon kind of, I mean, I don't remember very well, I was still kind of a, a, a relatively uh, very young, but I was like, I feel, it feels like we woke up one day and they're like, okay, you guys, no more war, war is done, go on with your lives. And uh, when I see what happened in other places like Sierra Leone, et cetera, like truth commissions, stand and confess to your things. I mean, maybe one or two people went to prison um politically motivated they should all have been in prison not uh and and for me that has been really interesting is that it's just like as if one day you like you just like t just like clean your rubble and get up and go on and i don't remember personally having any it's only when became when this when when um, I started doing my work and this became a personal project as much as a scholarly inquiry that I started looking into these geographies. But I don't remember them as a citizen, as a person who was living through it. That one, like there was even a coming mm -hmm. to terms with it. And so it's interesting that you're saying some people are collecting data, maybe for one day this is to happen, um, uh, like maybe to talk about responsibilities in the war. I didn't know about that, so that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Hiba. So I think uh, we should probably move on to Q&A, given that we've been talking for well over an hour now, uh, which has flown by, I should say, but I'm conscious that we have, um, we have a clock that we're working towards, but also we have a bunch of people who are watching all of this and, and some of whom I'm sure will have questions. So we have one already in from Ariel Ahram, um, who says there's a long discussion in political science about whether to treat the state as a unitary legal actor or as a forum for competition of societal actors or as a predatory extractor, which do you think is the best formulation for your purpose? I'll just ask uh, others if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So Sara, do you want to kick us off and then we can pass over to Hiba? That's fine. Um, so I think I, I, uh, my, my view of the state has uh, uh, changed a little bit, maybe, <laughs> or has radicalized a little bit, especially since uh, uh, August the 4th or, or October, even the year before, which uh, uh, tends a little bit more towards a predatory extractor uh, part of the compass. Uh, and um, I mean, the links with sectarianism of that extraction of resources and the links, you know, with capital accumulation that then goes back to, you know, the uh, the entrenchment of sectarian uh, dynamics as part of that of that neoliberal um, accumulation dynamics is very clear there. There is a triad between neoliberal capital accumulation, sectarianism and uh, resource extraction. And, um, and I, I think, you know, we, we can even go back historically, you know, with, you know, if you look at 19, uh, 1940s, 50s, 60s, Mount Lebanon and all of the issue with the change in the way uh, the production and manufacturing and export of silk, for example, was, was then, you know, changed and the impact it on, 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 on people at the same time when, you know, political sectarianism was being laid out as the foundation of, you know, modernity and a modern nation state. It's, it's very telling that, that sort of dynamic. Um, when I was writing the book, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, for me, the, the state as a hybrid between uh, different competing actors for, for different vision of what Lebanon is, you know, as, as, as a nation in the world was, was you know, the view, the view I was working with. Uh, for me, you know, now I am uh, I am much more inclined to, you know, towards more political ecological views of uh, of the state as as a resource extractor. And perhaps, you know, this goes back to to you know uh, the materiality. You know, is you know as, as Hiba said, you know, in the review forum we 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 had about your book. You know, you talk about 
can we start from the material, materiality of, of, of peace? Because I did ask you that question, you know, if the material situation, you know, the, if this is the physical space we have in the suburbs of Beirut, where is hope? You know, can we actually get out of the political religious organization just basically controlling the way space is organized and being at one with the state? Where is actually a way out? Is there a way out? Um, so, so yeah, perhaps I'm, I'm more pretending for the uh, the extractor state. Heba? Um, I, I mean, I think I, I already answered part of the question saying I, I personally avoid, um, did not avoid it. I talked about the state, but clearly said I'm not going to use it. Uh, and I stated why. So I kind of, in some ways, answered that question. But also, I'm not a political scientist. Uh, so I don't feel like, I mean, political science probably have a more like, okay, what they have to like label the state. I, I felt like I described what was going on. And I, I didn't use that word. But of course, I already stated how I think that we need to keep the state in vision because for accountability for all sorts of other things so i uh, but at the same time i'm also with sarah that we need to look for other places in which we can try to to say i mean what what i think has been really uh, hopeful in in beirut and uh, in the and i'll talk a little bit about the peripheries uh, is is uh, um, is how certain groups are trying to uh, think about the built environment or whether we're talking about public space, um, like all the different NGOs that are basically putting at the center uh, discussions about urban space and then uh, using that as a way to bring people who usually maybe from different quote unquote sectarian groups to think together about, about the shared built environment. The fact that we're going to have all, to all live in the city, the fact that we have to all figure out what's going to happen with the garbage, the fact that we are, all have to deal with the water and the fact that it's polluted, the fact that we can't go to the beaches or you can't like drink from the springs anymore. And I feel like, uh, I don't know if that was intentional, but I feel this is for me what has been hopeful is that when you start talking about what has been interesting from an urban perspective is that when you put an urban issue and then it's much more likely than to break down, to start breaking down little by little these like entrenched uh, identity politics and saying, you guys, we have to live in this city. We can, we're all like, irrespective if you're identif identifying as a Muslim or a Christian or this and that or Druze, in the end, we are all smelling the, the garbage. We are all not having trees and we are all uh, smelling CO2, uh, you know, uh, so, and I think, I mean, I'm, I'm biased for an urban perspective, for a, a spatial perspective, because this is what I'm an architect initially and then an urbanist and that's what I work on. But I do be believe that thinking about the built environment as a shared something that everyone has, has the potential to break away from at least or for people to hold to pin a little bit their sectarian affiliations or what their political groups tell them to come together around. And I think we saw it, we saw it happening. And um, when Occupy movement happened, uh, we were all very hopeful, right? I mean, uh, especially in like when you're like, especially from New York, for example, and, and I, was, I wasn't in New York at the time, I was San Francisco, but uh, also what was happening there. And I remember when, when the Occupy movement kind of died, I was like, one of the people who were devastated, I was like, oh, I thought we were gonna like bring the capitalist uh, socioeconomic system down, what happened? And so we had this interview with, uh, with David Harvey at the time, and I was still like a little bit more, um, I guess less cynical, or just asked him, I said, you know, like, I'm kind of sad or devastated after this like Occupy movement, like didn't kind of go anywhere. Uh, what, are your th what, what do you think, what are your thoughts at? And he said something to me that has been really, um, stayed with me. And he said, yes, it didn't like you, it might look like the Occupy movement. Um, I don't know if you use the word failed, but like, let's see the way it failed, but it didn't go away. For example, the reason that this Blasio and he came, he came to be thought of as a failed mayor, but at the time he was celebrated as someone who wanted to do public housing, who was someone who was like interested in breaking down racism, etc. The reason that he got um, um, elected, or the reason that the, there was a, a very fast response to Hurricane Sandy that hit New York is because of the groups that were organizing together during Occupy movement, and they got to know each other, and they were able to mobilize these resources to get a mayor who they hoped, and he failed, obviously, but they hoped he will do things differently, and to uh, actually um, um, uh, Respond, respond to the disaster. And I see that the same thing happened in the August 4th in Beirut. I wasn't there, but my brother's apartment was destroyed 
and the and the explosion and so but i was also still part of these whatsapp groups that we i was part of during the october uh, 2019 revolution and i saw how immediately people were mobilizing using these same networks that were developed <laughs> Uh, during the revolution to help with the disaster since the state was not the, the responsible was not there and so i think this is why i think of post-colonial hope so rather than locating hope as a total piece that like that like somehow there's going to be an erasure of all the histories that happened and how people felt about each other instead to think about the built environment as a shared resource that maybe can break the way or uh have people think about a different kind of horizon beyond the foreclosed future of sectarian politics and to basically think about um, what remains from the resistance that we mourn. So yes, we are mourning certain different resistance, but you think movement helped uh, the October 19 revolution, um, uh, uh, all the other gender fights for women, women rights, etc. all these groups were very constitutive of how the October revolution went and the hope it brought. And I can insist also that what maybe people think that the October uh, uh, 2019 revolution has died, but I feel like not all of it, that some of the things that have been uh, established then continue to produce new kind of geographies that hopefully are more helpful and more about uh, thinking differently about, uh, about uh, 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 living in, a, in the same city or living in the same country. Yeah. Hiba, where can we read this piece that you've written? Oh, uh, yeah, let me a find quick, it. Uh, a quick shout out for your piece. Uh, is it in, yeah, in Search for Hope? Yeah, this idea of post-colonial hope is fascinating yeah. and I'm sure there'll be others who would be interested in reading it as well. Okay, I'll, I'll put it in the chat here. Fantastic, thank you so much. How do I... Oh, this is the chat. Yeah. There's another question that's come in. So while you're doing that, I'll just flag it up. And it, it picks up on this theme of, of sovereignty and the state, which obviously speaks to me given my interests in, in sovereign power and its, its operation. And this actually um, from Hanadi Samhan flags up uh, actually one of the approaches that I use in, in my recent book, which is to, to put aside sort of the Western conceptions of state and to perhaps look at the, the, the operation of sovereign power. And Hanadi flags up some of the, um, some of the issues suggesting a division in understanding the state, linking it to sovereignty and its wider meaning representations and aesthetics in the religio identity conflict context of Lebanon. So it's sort of detaching the state and sovereignty from the Western model trying to move beyond yeah. uh, and trying to find other forms of state and, and its sovereign power. Um, we've had a number of, of discussions on this in, in SEPAD, particularly pertaining to, to Yemen and Syria, which of course, vastly different contexts to, to Lebanon. There were some interesting parallels that were drawn with regard to how to think about some of these questions. But I'd be really curious to hear, to hear your thoughts given the work that you've done on this, of course. So, Sara, again, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. hand over to you. Okay, so um, on, on sovereign power, I mean, and, and on relying on, on sort of non-Western knowledge of, knowledges of the state, um, yes, um, uh, definitely. I think, you know, coming away from the uh, traditional Weberian notion of sovereignty and as, you know, the, the, the Western view of state uh, controlling, you know, territory and political violence, absolutely. But but also I think that in terms of sovereign sovereign power, I mean, the ways I'm, I'm looking at it are mainly two. So one, which is the Agambian one, um, which, however, I mean, there has been a long discussion of how it tends to obliterate agency essentially. Um, and the other way is the, you know, more recent uh, Ashal Mambe view of sovereign power as a, a essentially an acropolitical, again, uh, resource extractive uh, and resource enclosing uh, entity, which then, you know, for me is a, speaks a little bit more to, to the way uh, um, the state is behaving nowadays in Lebanon, which is essentially continuously exposing the population to um, uh, to vulnerabilities. Um, the, for me, I, I tend to agree with with, with Hiba. Actually, um, this this issue about common urban matters and materiality 
um, and, and common urban causes um, for me is a more productive way of, of, way of thinking about organi organizing and, um, um, and governance and power. So in the end of the book, you know, I, I was talking about this period between, um, you know, the, uh, the, the Cedar Revolution of 2005 and the election of 2018, which many people uh, defined, especially, you know, again, in foreign policy, defined as a sort of period of, of, um, of an idol, idleness, political idleness and paralysis in Lebanon. Well, actually, uh, at the grassroots level, you have movements like like you stink, but even before that, you got the uh, the um, um, the secularism movement to um, to approve of uh, of civil marriage, um, and after that, you have obviously all of the the Beirut Madina movement, which you know does two things, which is one is moving away from the traditional structures of political parties and even like bringing their debates outside of the classical uh, uh, political uh, seats of power, you know, into the city, into people's neighborhoods. And, and also, you know, gathering around and catalyzing around uh, concrete urban issues like, you know, public space, uh, public greenery, uh, clean water, you know, waste. Um, and, you know, um, I remember when we were doing the research in, in, um, in Belfast on, on how urban space and religious radicalization, religious political radicalization work in, in uh, symbiosis, the case study we focused on, the Stewartstown Road, which used to be a particularly um, violent interface in West Belfast. What brought the communities together? to work together and find solutions to, um, you know, to, to bring uh, a pacification it was not so much a political discussion. It was actually solving a very concrete problem about um, a particularly bad um, street crossing, which uh, there, were, there was a school and kids were actually being run over because there wasn't a pedestrian crossing. So, people realized that they wanted traffic lights and a pedestrian crossing. And that was the origin of um, essentially a grassroots um, movement, way of organization, which then contributed to bring two communities together. And now, you know, they, they worked to, to regenerate the interface and um, um, bring it back as a sort of um, um, a multifunctional shops and services, you know, built environment. So they really coalesced around the built environments in ways that were, you know, they, they did politics by other means, really. So primarily, um, yeah. So for me, it's much more productive uh, to talk about the materiality of how power works than, than you know, power itself. So that's really interesting. Although I did think at one point as you're putting your headphones on, you'd pick them up and had just said that the way they solved them <laughs> it's because it's, it's not with there, headphones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with Sony headphones. So no, um... Perfectly timed. <laughs> Hibba, do you want to, to add something briefly? I'm conscious that we are almost out of time. Um, I think it, um, like Sarah put it beautifully, so maybe uh, we can we can um, leave it at that. But just to add also to what Sarah said, um, or to reinforce it, is that I feel even when studying the peripheries, it's very important to remember that these territorializations are not in stone. And and my own idea of of, of hope, even as a postcolonial form hope, of how these like even the uh, the kind of a uh, borderlines that get uh, defined during certain kinds of times of violence, like even 2008 or after it, like the small little battles that the people are having, that these lines are always ne negotiated, that these borders are not walls, right? And I feel in some ways when we're talking about older technologies that the fact that Trump here decided that the only way to stop is to actually buy, uh, build a literal wall, despite all the technologies we have in the world, is actually speaks to these, like, like there's certain kind of... Uh, um, physical structures that also are 
not only that, they are also symbolic and they're thought of as like sending a message. And I feel it's very important to think about the geography of Ramadan as not that, as the fact that even when, for example, Shweifit and Sahra Shweifit are, had, a con issue, had a small battle basically in 2008, actually like there is a, there's a lot of commerce going on, people still, it's a, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a porous thing that uh, can be made and unmade. And I feel like when we talk about Beirut, the fact that things can be made and made and negotiated as alliances shifted and flowed is actually where, um, paradoxically, I find the hope that it's actually not set in stone. It's not a wall. Uh, it's not the Berlin Wall. It's not the wall on the on the southern border or borders. But that are, these things are made and unmade. And as people change their um, priorities, maybe as the like flagging, for example, the built environment as a, as an important shared that they will start rethinking about these uh, boundaries that are basically created by political parties and put a different kind of understanding for these, uh, for these border geographies. And I feel this is for me what I find hopeful in the fact, thinking about sectarianism as something that is produced and made on a daily basis uh, and not something set in stone, uh, because that if you, if it's made, then you probably one day, hopefully, start on making it. What a wonderful note to uh, to almost end on, a, a message of hope and uh, a little glimmer of optimism. So thank you so much. Sarah, it's only fair of us, I think, to let you have the last word. So okay. is there anything else that you would like to add before I wrap this session up? Uh, I think I think just one, one more thing is, is to continue to think about in, in material uh, terms, uh, also, and and think about returns and overlapping histories, as as Iba pointed out. You know, help me really think through this uh, old boundary between the insider and outsider. I get very often asked, you know, but you don't live in Lebanon or you're not Lebanese, and how can you study Lebanon and the war? And you know, as Iba said. Actually, you can't be let off the hook by saying, oh, you're right, I'm an outsider, I cannot possibly understand. We are in the midst of, you know, Black Lives Matter, Brexit, uh, rampant inequality that COVID has exposed uh, in our cities. And, you know, uh, these are all very conflictual matters that we are implicated in. And I think that, of course, the trauma of war is unique. Uh, but I think that, you know, the, the unequal and violent uh, pasts and underpinnings of the dynamics we are going through in various places on Earth is really what we should think about to debunk binaries uh, of inside and outside when it comes to write about conflict. And I think we need to think more about that. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Before I just finally thank everyone, I've just been told that Amazon has one copy of your book left for £30, Sarah. So if anyone is short of a Christmas present for themselves or anyone else, £30. It's well worth it. But uh, on that, that note, I think I must thank uh, Sarah and Hibba for a wonderful discussion over the past 90 minutes. I've learned a great deal and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Sarah, thank you and congratulations on this absolutely wonderful book that is available on Amazon for £30 and other good bookshops for a little bit more. But um, Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming along. Uh, it's been a great event. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I wish you all season's greetings and stay safe and all the best for 2020.